graphic descriptions of contemporary hunters and the archaeological record suggest that the native... <laughs> okay. Hello, hello. Yes, I'm talking again, but I don't know what to say because I put away my book. Hopefully this is fine. Uh, and it's blanking out. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Hopefully the transmission is going well. I'm looking forward to the talk. I am sorry I can't be there at Crypto Day with all of you. Um, it's going to be very nice to talk to you all, and hopefully next year I'll be able to be there in person, but who knows? Blah, blah, blah. Testing, testing. Yeah.
Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I know that this is the last hour of 24 hours of Crypto Rave of interesting conversation and interesting talks, and I am very, very grateful for you to be here. The truth is, I, I don't actually know how many of you are there because I can't see you. I'm seeing myself talking and nothing else. So hopefully there are many people here uh, listening and uh, I can wave, but I only see myself waving. Anyway, I really wish I could be there with all of you and hopefully next year I could. Uh, this year I'm still under restrictions for travel and I'll explain a little bit more about what the situation looks like in a while, but uh, CryptoRave is one of my absolute favorite events in the world. It's one of the best combination of technology and activism out there. Um, and uh, it's always been one of my absolute favorite things to go to hang out with people. And, and I'm very envious of all of you. Uh, I think it's important to have these spaces where we share, where we talk to each other, where we learn from each other, where we have spaces where we can explore technology, but not just for the sake of technology, but for the sake of actually helping us do stuff. I think that that's extremely important. I also, before I begin, would like to extend a huge thank you to all the organizations and all the people that I know are listening that have been supporting me through these years. Thank you so much. Uh, I can't even describe how much that support has meant. And it literally has been the difference between me being in prison and, and me being able to live my life more or less normally here in Quito. Of course, I am super happy that the Crypto Rave organizers asked me to talk to you and um, they're always doing a great job and, and I was happy to be able to do this remote talk. So thank you for having me. I also, before I begin, would like to say hey, hi to all of the cops and all of the intelligence services that are no doubt in the room with you all, listening in digitally and physically. And my message to you are that you are not welcome. You're not welcome in our communities. You're not welcome in our spaces. And uh, we know that you are here, but you are not welcome. So please stop it. I will not be able to tell you everything about what has happened to me because sadly I'm still in the legal process. So there are some things that I will not be able to talk about, but uh, this is the first time I'm really talking about the case or and what has happened to me in any kind of big format at all without having a lot of restrictions. So um, I'll be able to tell a lot of things and a lot of stories that I haven't told before. There is also another aspect, which is <laughs> this has been the most crazy years of my life. If, if I told you everything, we could be sitting for several days and I wouldn't be able to cover all the stories and you all probably wouldn't believe most of the stories because there are some things that have happened that just are impossible to believe. And if you want to hear more of these kind of stories after this talk is over, my, my colleague Fausto, who is helping with the technical setup here, he is there with you in, in at the Crypto Rave. So find him and uh, ask him to tell you stories. Uh, he has a lot of things to, to talk about. So. My name is Ola Bini, if you don't know who I am. Um, my name is Ola Bini. I'm a Swedish developer. I live in Ecuador. I, I've been living in Ecuador for almost 10 years now. And I'm a programmer. I've been a programmer for all my life. But the last long stretch of my life, I've been working and focusing on security and privacy related software, specifically software to protect digital human rights. And um, here in Ecuador, I, I used to work for a company called ThoughtWorks. And um, maybe you know someone who works for them. They, we, we used to have offices in Sao Paulo and Porto Alegre and Recife and so on and so on. And um, my work for ThoughtWorks was actually to work on these kind of privacy preserving tools and technologies. But then about six years ago, I quit ThoughtWorks and started an NGO, a nonprofit organization called Centro de Autonomia Digital. And um, we actually started in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo was the headquarters of the first iteration of that organization. And uh, then in 2018, we moved to Quito, Ecuador, where we're still located. 
Centro de Autonomia Digital is an NGO that is focused primarily on defending digital rights, on building tools and software, free software always, and to educate. And, and that's what we do. Now, the people who have heard of me might know that I've been part of a legal process. And that legal process actually started four years ago on the 11th of April in uh, 2019. And this was very soon after we'd started up CAD, my organization uh, in, in Quito. Um, and this was the same day that Julian Assange was thrown out of the Ecuadorian embassy and arrested by the British police on behalf of the American uh, police forces. Now, uh, part of this story is also the fact that I am a friend of Julian. Um, I, I got to know him in 2013 for the first time, 10 years ago. And since then, I, I used to visit him in the embassy and we, we became friends. So, on that day, it was a Thursday, I, I was on my way to the airport because I was going to Japan, I was going to practice martial arts in Japan, and um, it was a trip that I planned for a long time. The same morning, the in Minister of the Interior of Ecuador and also the Foreign Minister had had a, a, Rueda de Prensa, a press conference where they talked about why Julian was why Julian's asylum was revoked. But in this press conference, they also mentioned that here in Ecuador, there existed two Russians and a close collaborator with WikiLeaks. And, and they claimed that these people had been conspiring with the previous government in order to destabilize the current government. Um, I didn't really think more about it at that point. It was one of those moments where, okay, that sounds very strange, but okay, well, I'm not Russian. It's clear that they couldn't mistake me for a Russian person. So, so clearly this has nothing to do with me. So I went to the airport. I went through all the filters and, and, uh, and I went to wait for my flight, like I usually do when I fly. And I was sitting at the airport uh, reading a book and uh, suddenly comes a huge number of people and they basically told me to come with them. They, they never identified themselves. They never actually gave me any papers. They just took me away, basically, and, and they didn't have any cop clothes or anything like that. So uh, in my mind, I keep thinking about this as a kidnapping, because at the end of the day, they never actually used an illegal capability to, to take me. They never explained why. They never told me what was going on. And then they took me away and I was arrested and they kept me away. They kept me hidden. Uh, they stopped me from using my phone to communicate with my friends and family. And um, they kept me hidden from three in the afternoon until eight in the morning the next day in different places. So I didn't get access to a lawyer. My consulate wasn't told. Basically, all of these different things were done. And uh, this was very confusing because I didn't really speak any Spanish. I didn't really know what happened. I just, they, they just held me there. And I wasn't allowed to talk to a lawyer, which if you've seen any movies or TV shows, you know that the one right you have is to always talk to your lawyer. But um, it, it turns out that if the, if the cops don't want you to talk to a lawyer, they will basically stop you from talking to a lawyer. Uh, what I didn't know was that a call had been made uh, when I roughly at the same time as I'd come to the airport, I call a, an anonymous tip had come into the police saying that I was the person basically that the minister had been talking about and that I was fleeing to the airport. Now, this anonymous tip line is one of those things where you're supposed to report crimes and, and going to the airport or, or being a person that the minister talks about are not considered crimes in Ecuador or at least they're not supposed to be considered crimes, but that was the justification they used to arrest me. Um, the next day, they took me to regular holding cells. There was a, um, one part of the Ecuadorian justice system is something called formulación de cargos, which is basically a hearing in front of a judge where they decide to, if they are gonna charge you or not. And they did that on the Friday and they decided that they were gonna put me in 
prisión preventiva, like preventative imprisonment, and uh, start looking for evidence. So they didn't really have any proof of anything. And in fact, the prosecutor, the things he presented as reasons for putting me in prison was books in English about programming. Yeah. Um, they had uh, many pictures of the USB drives that I carry around my neck because I need to protect things. They had a number of things from my apartment that they had raided. Uh, so a big part of the argument here was that basically I have too many English books and I have too many computer devices. So that means that I'm a suspicious person that can't be trusted to not run away. So they put me in prison and I stayed in prison for 70 days completely. We tried many different types of recourses to try to overturn this decision because it was clear that it was completely illegal. And finally, in June, the same year, I was released under, under this thing called the habeas corpus, which is basically an oversight mechanism that is in the constitution of most countries. And in this habeas corpus, the judges decided that the violations against my rights had been so extreme on my day of detention that the, the order of uh, imprisonment couldn't be valid. But what they instead did is that they put something called medidas cautelares, which are restrictions, and, and they can be arbitrary restrictions. So since I came out of prison, I have to present myself at the prosecution every week. Every Friday, I have to go and sign a paper uh, at the prosecution's office. I do not have access to my bank accounts. They are frozen. And I am not allowed to leave the country. And of course, all of the things they stole from me are hidden away in Criminalistica, in the uh, criminal sciences and forensics department. Um, and that's where I am right now still. We've gone through the trial, the first trial, but I still have these medidas cautelares. That's why I can't travel to, to Brazil. Um, that's why I can't see my family or my relatives. That's why I have a lot of problems with, <laughs> with money because it's kind of complicated without having bank accounts to live in modern society. Uh, of course, those restrictions are the official ones. But there is also the case that I am being surveilled all the time. I'm being followed all the time. And, and this has been going on for four years. In fact, when I was going to the airport, I thought that everything was fine. I didn't really think about anything. But afterwards, we've seen the tapes from the airport. And it turns out that even before this, this call came in, this so-called anonymous tip, they were following me to the airport and they were following me around the airport. Every day when I go out, I have surveillance after me. I have undercover cops on motorcycles. I have undercover cops in official um, intelligence agency cars. There are other like weird things happening all the time. And this surveillance happens. It continues happens. It, it's every single day uh, for almost four years. And one of the things we talk about so often is, how much is this costing the Ecuador government to do the surveillance? It's absolutely insane. Uh, and the surveillance is not only me. They, they have surveilled my lawyers, my friends. They even in one moment when I was spending some time with a journalist who was writing a book about me, I, I was there with uh, my, my parents. And uh, we actually noticed like surveillance following us, even in that situation. Uh, I've had even my my martial arts teacher has been uh, followed on motorcycle and other weird things. Uh, and it's not just the, the following, but it's also things like we had a weird break in at work. We had um, uh, a few years ago, there was a car outside of my apartment building with like an with a person sticking an antenna out through the back window. And he was just sitting there with the antenna pointing at my house for half an hour. And we have pictures of all of this and yeah. We see drones. We try to have sensitive conversations with the lawyers and, and we have to walk around in parks to do that. And, and there is always people surrounding us and so on and so on. It's it, it's constant. And um, 
first I thought that this started, all of this started with Julian. All of this started with like the Thursday uh, in, in April, four years ago. But recently we've also seen pictures that show that I was under surveillance before that day. Uh, we still don't know why. We still don't know who did that surveillance. We have tried to stop the surveillance. We tried to find out who ordered it, but uh, we have gotten no answer. Well, we've gotten answers, but clearly some of those answers must be lies because this kind of surveillance doesn't happen by itself without an order. Anyway, so after I came out of prison, I was in, um, uh, in the investigative period. And um, this investigative period lasted up until the end of August. And during this time, they found a picture on my phone, uh, a picture that shows, well, they claim that this is a picture that shows a terminal session. And they claimed that this is proof that I broke in to the systems of CNT, which is the public telecommunications company here in Ecuador. Uh, if you actually have seen this picture, I, I don't have it in front of me now, but uh, if you actually look for the picture, the EFF has it, for example, it's easy to find. You will see that this is a telnet session that actually shows the opposite. It shows someone doing a terminal session that does not actually break in, they stop without putting in a username or a password. But at that point, the prosecution decided to change their accusation because this is also one of those weird things where my case started with this accusation that I've been trying to destabilize the government. And then my charges was actually attacking the integrity of computer systems. But they never told me, they never actually told me and my lawyers which computer systems, when, why, how. It was just the crime, like the, the crime numeral in the in the in the law, and they never specified more. And, and we tried to get them to say this. And, and basically, the answer we got from the prosecutor was, no, no, it's up for you to tell us what you've done, not for us to tell you. And yeah, that makes very much sense. Right. Uh, so then they changed this charge, and now the charge became breaking into the telecommunication systems of this telecommunication systems company. And we started doing some research to try to kind of find the evidence for this. I, I started collecting technical witnesses that we could help, like, kind of serve as expert witnesses in, in a trial. And we continued doing this kind of work. And, and at the same time, we had an expert here in Ecuador who was helping us write a report about the about this specific technical aspect of the so-called crime. And two weeks after he wrote that report, um, he was raided and um, he was basically, he was, um, his license to be a, an expert witness was taken away. And um, they claimed that this is because he had an error on his CV, on his resume. So uh, after that, uh, as an aside, this man, he was charged with the crime of fraude processal, which is a serious crime. Uh, they claimed that he had tried to lie to the judges. And um, I'll, I'll come back to this as well. But basically, his situation never went to trial because three weeks ago, the judge in charge of the case decided that it, it didn't have any merits to go to trial. So they basically destroyed this man's life, not, not for the purpose of destroying him, but, but because he helped me. And this is kind of one of these patterns where you can see that these people, they go after people around you. They, they have absolutely no limits. If they can go after anyone, they go after the ones they can. And um, that, is, that is tough to live with. I mean, this is one of those things where I, I can see the impact this has on my parents. I can see the impact this has had on this expert witness. And it feels very challenging to be in this situation. Now, this so-called breaking into CNT, um, they only found out about this potential idea in August. So why did they actually arrest me? Why, why did they detain me? Well, we still don't actually know why all of this happened. Um, it's challenging because all of these motivations are shrouded. We, we don't know why these decisions were made because none of the people that made them have ever talked about it. We have some guesses, 
and some indications. And, and the most simple one is just that the Ecuador government wanted to have like a local person to blame for Julian Assange and for, for uh, taking away his asylum. So they knew that I visit, visited Julian and they found that this was a convenient person to accuse of something random. Now, what they didn't know was that I would have so much support. So they, they I, my guess is that the plan was to just throw me in prison and, and forget me. But they didn't know that I was going to have a lot of support from a huge amount of people that would help me defend myself. Of course, that doesn't really explain all these weird things, why they continued, why they've held this up and, and all the other things that have happened. So a few years back, a local news organization, uh, La Posta, they published a investigation where they tied my arrest into a scandal that hit the, um, the, the government at that time. So this was 2019 and, and just a few weeks before my arrest, the current president at the time, Lenin Moreno, uh, had stories leaked about him that basically showed financial problems with uh, like a lot of money going away to, to tax havens and, and things like that for some of his family members. And this leak, which is called the INA papers here in Ecuador, also contained private pictures that were embarrassing for the president. So what this, um, what this investigation by this news agency kind of revealed, and, and there was a lot of details, complicated ones, but the gist of it is the president at the time wanted to find whoever was responsible. The interior minister asked her intelligence people to give her who was responsible. They gave than me. They said that it was me who had done it, even though other intelligence people told her, no, he's not the one. But the uh, minister went to the president and said that it was me who had uh, basically stolen these things and leaked them, even though I had absolutely no connection with it, of course, and that this was the reason. I don't know. There might be other situations or other reasons involved or and, and to some degree, it might not matter. My, my, one of my advisors in this situation, Pedro Donoso, he's been talking about how even if there was a reason to begin with, it doesn't really matter because after all of this is done and finished, I was useful to all the different political parties for different reasons. They used me for their purposes. And, and so that meant that I was like a puzzle piece or a playing piece that they could just manipulate and, and manipulate perception in a way that was helpful for their cause. So it took almost three years for me to get to trial. The trial started in 2022 in January, a little bit more than a year ago, and it lasted for almost exactly a year. This trial was, um, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. Um, it was a farce. It was, if it wasn't my life that was on the line, I would be able to laugh about it because there was so much stuff wrong here. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the moments, maybe one of the more interesting moments was when, um, so Roger Dingelein is one of the creators of Tor and uh, he was one of the expert witnesses in my case. And the prosecutor was asking him questions about, um, well, he was trying to talk about bad hackers, black hats, those kind of people. Um, and at some point, Roger must have men uh, mentioned a, like the concept of a white hat hacker, people that try to do good things, basically. And maybe you, if you don't know me, you might not know this, but I basically always wear a black hat. It's been part of my style for 20 years. And I, I always, when I go outside, I have a black hat. So at that moment, when Roger mentioned the white hats, the prosecutor literally asked, okay, and what about black hats? And then kind of looked over in my direction where my black hat was sitting literally on the desk in front of me. And basically the whole, the whole courtroom just started laughing because it was so ridiculous. And even one of the judges passed by later and asked one of my legal team, like, 
and pointed to my hat. Hey, was that the black hat that the prosecutor was talking about? There were many of these kind of moments, um, too many to mention once again. But what is important is at the end of all this, um, on the 29th of January in 2023, I was declared, or rather, I was ratified innocent by the three judges. And um, this was very powerful. And um, it was unexpected because we believed that they would act in a political manner. But um, my, my read is that the prosecution did such a bad job that the, the judges just didn't have a choice. They couldn't condemn me under those circumstances. And, and when I say they did a bad job, I mean, I'm not talking about only things like this black hat thing. I'm talking about, for example, the prosecution in their end um, cl closing argument, they were saying things like, as a direct quote, the person that does um, that, sorry, excuse me. I'm, I'm trying to mix between or not mix between the Spanish and the English, because of course he said this in Spanish. Um, Basically, the one who has nothing to hide has nothing to fear. He also prosecuted me under the wrong law. And uh, like literally, he accused me under a law that wasn't active during the time period of the, the so-called crime, which is completely impossible in Ecuador. So he was being quite clumsy. But at the same time, and, and I might come back to this too, um, it's also very dangerous. The idea that a prosecutor has the perspective, and, and this prosecutor, he's supposedly one of the most experienced cyber prosecutors in Ecuador, and that he would say something like that, that if you have nothing to fear, you, um, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, is quite dangerous. And, and I'm, also, I'm also very uncomfortable because CNT, the, the telecommunications company, for a lot of time, and, and what's important here is that picture, it showed that... Uh, the terminal session showed that Tor was used in this connection. So CNT has been saying since the beginning of the case that using Tor is basically the same as admitting to being a criminal, th that you can't use Tor without being for a criminal purpose. And that's also an extremely dangerous point of view, because, of course, as you all know, we, we, we use Tor all day long. We use Tor to protect our lives. It is something that is a necessary tool for the, the activism and the work we do. And the idea that that's something that should be suspicious is extremely scary. But this brings me to another interesting point. When I was raided and they took all my devices, of course, I, I have a bunch of, had a bunch of computers in my home. I had a bunch of computers with me. I had USB drives. I had hard drives, all that stuff that you work with as a computer professional. Um, the forensics and, and computer science departments of, of the police here in Ecuador, they try to break into the systems. And they asked me for the passwords for my systems. I did not give them my passwords. I, I actually said, uh, I didn't say no. I actually said, hey, if you tell me what you're actually accusing me of, I'll tell you, I, I, can, I will consider helping with the passwords. But they never actually told me what I was being accused for in this time period, because th this was the time period where they just told, said that I detected integrity of computer systems. So I never gave them my passwords. And, and in Ecuador, at least, you have the right to deny that request. Uh, maybe, maybe a side note that I do not use fingerprints. I do not use face ID or any kind of facial recognition or anything like that. I, I find them very legally troubling because the cops in most, in many countries, the cops have the right to open with your face ID or with your fingerprints without your uh, agreement, but they can't do that. They can't force you to give up a password in, in most situations. So I, I use that right and I, I did not open it. And, and of course, I don't feel like I have anything to hide. I don't feel like I had any, any, I mean, I haven't done anything that would merit criminal prosecution. I haven't done anything illegal, but um, I do have things to protect. I mean, I communicate with people at risk. I've, I've helped people that are in scary situations around the world. And, and for that reason, I felt that it was irresponsible of me to, to open up the devices. 
And of course, the, the prosecution, they did say what, what you always hear them say. It's like, well, if you haven't done anything criminal, you can just, you can just open it up and we can review it and we can, we can check it. Doesn't that sound reasonable? Well, first, I don't trust them to not plant something. Second, I don't trust them to not leak stuff. I don't trust them to understand what's in there. And maybe most importantly, it's not my trust to give because there are things in there that other people have given me that they trusted me with. And I can't just transfer that trust to someone else and say, well, I trust these cops with the secrets of someone else. No, that's not acceptable. And at the end of the day, we fight for privacy and privacy is a human right. Privacy is one of the most fundamental human rights for democracy. And uh, we shouldn't give up that. And, and opening up devices just because the cops want you to open them up, that is not acceptable in a democratic society. And of course, there is also the other thing, which is that my, my experience has been that the technical understanding of these parts of the police force hasn't been as they haven't been as sophisticated as I'd hoped. And, and I wasn't sure that they, even if they did get the passwords, that they would be able to safely actually protect the information in there. Anyway, um, all of my things were encrypted, of course. And um, Ecuador actually decided to ask the US for help to break into my things. So they did, but nothing ever came out of that. And uh, I think that this is one of those important messages. I use many different types of encryption, but even the basic Linux encryption is fine. If you have a good enough password, encryption works. The whole gov like at this point, this was the whole government of Ecuador that wanted to get me. They wanted more than anything to get into my encrypted devices, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it with the help of the US, and they couldn't do it themselves. And that means that encryption works. It still works. And, and um, that is something that I think we should take into account when we plan uh, how to manage our risks, basically. So I mentioned surveillance. And, and I'm sure that there are many of you in the audience that have been or are involved in activist activities of different kinds. Uh, whether that be political or, or other types of activities. But at the end of the day, activism is one of those things that always generates surveillance by police forces. You will always have undercover intelligence agencies. And, and um, I think this is one of those lessons that I think I really didn't understand in the before. I, I knew how surveillance works, but knowing that it's there, that your life is constrained by it forever, is uh, it can be very limiting. It's one of those things where you, every time you meet a friend, you think about, okay, should I actually go and, and bring my surveillance to this friend? Or is it better that I stay away? Um, I wanted to go to the demonstration this week, to, to the May 1st demonstration. And um, I wasn't sure if I should do it. And I decided to not do it because I was sure that if I went, there would be undercover cops and un undercover intelligence people on, uh, inside of the demonstration that would be putting my friends in more risk. Um, so surveillance, surveillance is tricky because it, even if you know it's there, even if you know the purpose of it, it still works. It still constrains your capabilities, what you can do. And it has a big impact on your mental health. And, and I think that this is something that we as, we as from an activist perspective, as a civil society perspective, as a movement perspective, we need to take care of each other. Because I think the, the mental health impact of living this life under our current circumstances, and, and I'm sure there are many people here that are listening to me right now that know what I'm talking about, this is something that is not easy to bear. We have more suicides in our type of type of work than, than most other groups. And, and that is something that is really serious. And, and a part of that has to do with the pressures of, of understanding and, and trying to change reality. But, but the other side of it is 
actually living under these circumstances with surveillance. And I think we need to be build better structures to support our groups uh, from this perspective. I think looking at the future a little bit, the, the surveillance capabilities of something like Pegasus is extremely terrifying. We are already in a stage where you can't even call Pegasus targeted because it, it sweeps up so many people in its nets. So it's going to be very difficult to do political work in the future, knowing that our digital communications are, are not as well protected as they should be. And at the same time as physical surveillance is still a real problem. And, and I think that this is where we have to go back to the roots. We have to start thinking again seriously about how to think about threats, how to do threat modeling based on the current reality. We need to get better at just the basic security hygiene stuff, things like, I, I mean, encryption and, and good passwords. If we do encryption and good passwords, that is like 90% of the way. But at the same time, people like me, technological people that are working on the software, we need to do a better job of actually making software that non-technological people can use. And we need to get better at talking to each other because I know that people in, in my crowd of technical people, we have a tendency to just sit down and do the super duper most technical, most cool cryptography thing and blah, blah, blah. And, and it feels really cool. And it's like, oh, so cool. Snowden could use this. Okay, great. But most people are not Snowden and, and the threats they are under are maybe not at that level. And, and maybe it's more important that things are usable in a way that means that people will actually use the tools uh, and that they protect them. And I mean, for example, I think that this is where uh, the work that Signal has done on usability is very good. I, I don't like cell phones. I, I believe that they are very insecure and problematic. And, and even something like Signal, which in my opinion is one of the better alternatives on cell phones, is kind of hitting an upper limit on what's possible in a mobile phone. Um, because of all the, like, because basically the architecture of baseband and things like that. But the focus on usability is something that has made the encryption much more available to more people. Let's encrypt making it so simple to set up a certificate for your website is one of those things that basically is probably one of the biggest reasons why most websites now have HTTPS. And Tor, I mean, I know that the Tor project are spending a huge amount of time and resources doing user testing every single year to improve the, the experience of using the Tor browser to make it so that people can just start using it without going through hoops or understanding the technology. And, and of course, I'm not saying that understanding that technology is bad, but it can't be the limit for people. I think one of my biggest takeaways, so I, I have a few takeaways from my own situation from this, from this whole situation. The first one is I made a huge mistake in my personal threat model. I protected a lot of my stuff against attacks from a lot of different types of countries, but I didn't evaluate the risk of Ecuador properly, where I was living, which obviously was catastrophic failure. So if I, that, that's the first thing. And, and that's also the reason why some of my keys are not under my control. Well, they're not under anyone's control because they're still encrypted, but I don't have access to them because I didn't have backups for some of those keys and passwords because my backup strategy was based on other types of threat models. And that was a huge mistake. And going back, I, I wish I'd done that work better. I think the fact that encryption works is super important and, and we need to keep that in mind. It's very easy to become like a privacy nihilist and, and I have sometimes been like that as well. But at the same time, my experience tells me that yes, encryption actually works and it can protect us, but encryption is a tool and we just need to use it properly under the right circumstances. And that's true for other types of tools like Tor and all these other things that are out there. They're tools, but how we use them is based on our circumstances.
I, I've talked a bunch about stuff and I, I keep like thinking about I have these million things that I, I should talk about that I'm forgetting. Uh, but honestly, I, I've been talking for almost 50 minutes now and, and maybe it would be more useful if we have the possibility of taking questions. Is that possible? <laughs> Hopefully someone will answer me somewhere where I can hear it. Anyone? Sorry, can you? Can you Hola, hi. Uh -huh. it's, it's Elisa. Hi. Just a minute. Hi, Elisa. Uh, they will make the question in Portuguese, then I can translate to you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Pode. Olá, você acredita? Algumas vezes que essa uh, perseguição, vigilância. A vigilância acontece dentro da sua casa? Uh, Olá, do you believe that this surveillance is happening inside of your house? Yes, uh, I'm fairly certain that there are um, there are bugs all over my place. I basically and. and it's also the case that my workplace in my office, uh, where CAD works, that we believe that there are surveillance in there as well. In fact, it's it's bad enough that we, when we're in the car, when we're in the office, when we're at home, when we say something that can be misinterpreted, we just say like mentira, and, and we usually we say mentira Maria Paula Romo because that's like the name of the minister of the interior at that time. So the joke is that she's always listening to what we're saying everywhere, but. It's one of those jokes that is not really a joke because I do believe it and, and it's something that basically you have no way of detecting that kind of surveillance in all ways. And even if you get rid of it, you still might have a cell phone or something that is backdoored. So in general, you just have to accept that the surveillance is there and not say things that you don't want to have heard. Did you get this? She's yes. very, very sad. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm so I, I don't want to make anyone sad and there are there are good things that have come out of this. And of course I'm just one of many, many people. I'm not special in any way. I've been lucky to have good friends that have supported me, but there are friends all around the world. Uh, maybe 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 the most prominent in my head is Allah, who is a friend in Egypt who's been in and out of prison for the last 10 years, basically. So this stuff keeps happening and we need to change it. But this is not individual change. This is something that we, we need to change our governments and that's collective change. Uh, in English or in can you Can you hear her? It's a little bit echoey, so, so uh, whatever the person is uh, comfortable here, saying, maybe you can just repeat the question if I don't get it. Hey, hola, this is uh, Isabella. Hi. Uh, hola, Isa. I have uh, a couple of questions. One is um, related to the feature, right? I wonder um, if the, I forgot the term, but the fact that you still need to go every Friday and sign up, do you think this can be correlated to the fact that the fate of Julian Assange haven't been decided yet? And this is like just a mechanism, right? Like to contain you somehow because of the believed connection. And the other question is, um, can you counter sue these people? Can you like uh, bring to international court or something regarding to the uh, mistreats of your rights that has been going on? Is there any way to do that? Or if it is, like, uh, what is the process that you pretend you're hoping to follow? Okay. Thank you, Isa, and, and good to hear from you. It's been a long time. Um, let's take the second question first. So counter suing. So the way Ecuador's system work, and I, I think this is the way it works in most countries. The main case, the main legal case has to be finished before you can before you can do anything else. So I cannot go to an international court before I have. Well, the, the official language they use, they say exhausted all uh, domestic possibilities. So I have to use everything that is possible to do in Ecuador before I can go internationally. 
So that means that in the case of my case, I have to wait until all the appeals and everything are done to all the instances before I can appeal to the International Court of Human Rights or the, or the Inter-American Court, for example. Uh, in terms of countersuing, of course, those work the same way. Um, if I try to countersue here or sue for damages, they will discard the case because they will say that the case is not finished yet. However, um, we have a case in progress that is based on the habeas corpus because the habeas corpus is finished and we do have a case in progress about that. We, the, it was accepted, but it's not public yet, so I, I can't really say more about it right now. But we are trying to do that, but there is nothing that can actually change the situation or stop the situation right now. Um, about the other case, so, so the, the presentation, um, this is, so Ecuador has this situation where basically a lot of people get sent to prisión preventiva. Uh, the, the prosecution always asks for it, and it doesn't matter if you stole a, stole a pen or, or, I don't know, you wrote wrong name on a CV or whatever. The prosecution will always ask for prisión preventiva. And most of the time, the judges will actually go ahead with it. So a lot of people go to this preventative imprisonment for no good reason. And a lot of the times, they manage to get out in different ways. And when they get out, they, they get Medidas Capitalis. And, and this with, um, 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 with the presentation is one of the more common ones. And in fact, once a week is pretty mild, I've, I've come to understood, because some people have to present every day. There are even some people that have to present in the morning and in, in the afternoon. But to the wider question, if this is connected to Julian's case, we have certainly entertained the possibility that it feels like they have been dragging, dragging things out, right? They, they keep extending, they keep every, everything takes months and it drags out in a way that it shouldn't. So it feels like they are trying to take more time. And, and uh, one of the reasons for that could be that there is a plan to, to wait and see what happens with Julian and then see if they can do something with me. Olá, he wants to know if you know about another cases that uh, people that are involved with Assange that pass for the same thing that you are passing? Um, well, th there have been a few different things with Assange that, um, that have been happening over the last few years. Nothing similar to my case, but I know that, for example, uh, Chelsea Manning uh, was um, there was an attempt to make Chelsea Manning actually testify against Julian in front of a um, in front of a grand jury a few years back, and she decided to not comply with that order, and she was actually sent to prison for non-compliance, and and she also got a huge fine for this for every day that she didn't follow the order of the judge she actually got a huge fine for every single day but finally after a few months of that they, they actually stopped and, and she was released from prison but that was one case we also know that jeremy hammond was asked to testify and he also said no and if i remember correctly he um, his prison stay was extended for that reason as well so there the, the u.s government seems to be applying different types of pressure in different situations against different people to try to get their way. So far, well, I, I didn't mention this, but, but um, while I was still in prison, the US government did want to talk to me. But then um, a few weeks later, they actually withdrew the request. They, they said that they were not interested anymore. So I don't know if I'm interesting to them. I hope not. But if I'm of interest to them, then, then maybe maybe that's what is happening but i haven't seen anything similar i know that other people are under surveillance and 
other kinds of things. But this kind of situation seems to be unique to the Ecuador-U.S. relationship. Uh, hey, can you listen? Yeah, I hear you. So thank you for your awesome talk. I'm really sorry of everything that happened. So, uh, since you've mentioned mobile phones, I would like, like to ask you, because it's become such a convenient tool, because it's like, has a battery, has connectivity, and basically like the average person just cannot live without it. So, mm -hmm. I'd, like, I'd like to ask you, like, any countermeasure we can do to the insecurities, like, like reducing all into the essential applications, just like the most secure ones, like uninstalling any like social media stuff or I don't know mobile game that that, that that's actually like spying you and everything just like that. So all the things you mentioned are good practices and, and they're good things to do, but they're not going to solve the fundamental problem because <laughs> the, the problem is that the mobile phone is very convenient for you, but it's also very convenient for the people spying on you. Now, the, the, the real problem with mobile phones has to do with the architecture of how they are, uh, basically how they're built. Uh, basically, every mobile phone has two comp computers inside. The, the, the computer that you have that is running iPhone or Android or whatever, and then you have the baseband, which is basically a completely separate closed source computer that is in charge of all the kind of the communications. And uh, this one is the computer that is controlled in your phone, which means that you don't even have access to the most com important component part of your phone. Um, so, so that's a big problem. Another big problem is that the attack surface is quite big. And, and because a mobile phone is supposed to be reachable, it's like the, the whole point of a mobile phone is to be reachable. So, so that's why, for example, Pegasus, many of their attacks have used messages over FaceTime or iMessage to infect iPhones because those, uh, those applications are always on. They're always listening. So if there's a bug there, it gives access directly to, to the operating system. But, but the other side of the problem is that all this stuff about how a phone works, how does a mobile phone work? Well, well basically, you, you have cell phone towers, right? And your cell phone is in constant contact with the closest cell phone towers. What that means is that the cell phone towers always know where you are. So the virtue of, of a mobile phone being a mobile phone, the fact that it's a mobile phone means that it always knows where you are. It's, it's a side effect of how it's architected, of how, how the whole system works. So practical advice for me is, I mean, it depends once again on, on your threat model. Of course, not everyone should do what I do. But for example, I don't turn on my phone outside of my house. I, I actually, I have my phone with me because I don't want it to be modified, but I keep it turned off and I keep it in a Faraday cage to stop any kind of electromagnetic emissions, uh, and I only use it from home. That is super frustrating, and it kind of, it kind of, kind of takes away most of the benefits of having a mobile phone. Basically, my mobile phone is is actually not a mobile phone; it's a fixed phone, without a cable. But um, for my purposes, that that's what I need to do to to control the risk. I, I prefer to use chat on computers because it's easier to, to do those in a secure way and, and more advanced cryptography and routing and things like that. And, uh, and there is also compartmentalization, which means basically that you should separate things that don't have anything to do with each other. So, for example, if you can separate, like if you have, if you use your phone for work, if you can separate the phone you use for work from the phone you use for personal stuff, that would be good because that reduces the attack surface of each other and so on and so on. But there are many techniques, but the basic one is like, if you're going to a sensitive meeting, I would recommend not having the phone because it's not only you it's putting in danger, it's putting in danger all the people that are there. So I think one of the, one of the things that is one of my, one of my obsessions is that we need to, reduce the reliance of mobile phones and go back to more controlled communications because mobile phones are a trap. So thank you very much, Ola. Uh, we are really, Muito obrigado. <laughs> we're really happy to have you here, but we would like to have you here uh, 
uh, here, <laughs> not just online. And we are too, for too. this since 2019. So I hope that next year we can have it here on the keynote. <laughs> so I, I, I really <laughs> hope so. <laughs> I already uh, in advantage. Uh, in advantage, I'm asking you to be our keynote in 2024. <laughs> 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 I have no idea what we were talking about, so you have one year to prepare. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> Too yeah. much time to think. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> thank you very, very much. And thank you, Pat, people to help us to have this uh, online uh, streaming for like in a short, short notice. <laughs> and, thank you. Uh, I will now talk in Portuguese just to, co to close the crypto hand. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, gracias, gracias. Um, just to mention one thing, if, if anyone has any questions about any of the stuff we talked about, like I, I'm on Mastodon, I'm on Twitter, I'm easy to find, so please reach out, my, my email address is my name basically, so please reach out if you have any questions or thoughts or if you want to talk about any of these kind of subjects, I'm, I'm here to support our communities. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. A gente não vai coitar, é só, é só para ele ter, para ele ter noção de que tinha alguém aqui ouvindo ele. Porque é muito ruim você fazer uma palestra e não tá vendo, tá vendo só seu computador, assim, é, é muito chato. É, eu queria agradecer a todo mundo que veio na Crypto Rave, a gente vai fazer uma falinha bem curta porque a gente tem que começar a fechar as coisas aqui no CSSP agora. É, como todos os nossos voluntários, tipo a Mayara, estão há 24 horas de pé, quem estiver aí disponível com aquela forcinha para ajudar a gente a juntar as cadeiras em blocos de 20 aqui nesse canto do fundo dado, já vai ajudar muito. A gente ainda tem que descer tudo para a garagem, recolher as